not here to convert people. We're here to be Jesus in our world. Wow, and that is so exciting to me. So exciting. This is Vantage Point, the teaching ministry of Faith Center Four Square Church in Eureka, California. Pastors Matt and Heidi Messner bring biblical, practical, and relevant teaching each week. You can learn more about Faith Center at eurekafaithcenter.org. Now, let's listen to today's message. Well, early this week, there were a few of us from the staff who went to a pastor's conference in Sacramento just for a couple days. Uh, once a year, our district of four square churches, which is about 200 churches from Northern California, Nevada, and Utah, we meet uh, to be encouraged. And so that was this week. And during that conference, uh, Pastor Joe Kenke, our next gen pastor, was actually ordained. So, congratulations to Joe. So just, just call him Reverend Joe, or Right Reverend Joe if you want. No, we're not really into titles, but you might want to just call him that anyway and see what he says or how he responds. But one of the speakers at the conference was a man named Jerry Cook, and we had Jerry come a year ago. Uh, it was actually at the end of August, so it's been about a year since he's been here. But he was one of the keynote speakers at the conference. And when I heard Jerry was going to be one of the speakers, I thought, wow, this is great. One of my favorite speakers, one of my closest friends, and I was really looking forward to the conference, and I said, Jerry, would it be possible for us just to take you home with us after the conference? Just come along and come up to Eureka. I mean, it's really close to Sacramento by uh, Humboldt County standards, and so uh, as he was thinking about it, I said, by the way, I think the half-pounders are running up the Klamath River. Jerry's a fly fisherman, so I think that little extra bribe, we got him to come and to be with us this weekend, and there's really no one who has had as deep an impact on my view of ministry, my view of what the church is, uh, my view of God. Really, uh, no individual has had a more profound impact on shaping those things in my life than, than Jerry Cook. So he, I, we are blessed to have him with us, and he's going to be speaking on the Monday Morning Church. He has a book by that title. It's really a study on the book of Ephesians, and I asked him just to take that topic on with us this morning. And so I want to give away one of these books. I bought like 50 of them. They're out at the Welcome Center after service. And so I like it when people sit in the front row. And so do you have a copy? Oh, you, you got your hand up. All right, there you go. And you sit here every week. You were hoping to get one because you knew I did this last service, right? Oh, man, I, I, maybe we can help you after service. But um, you too. Well, you can buy them, actually. <laughs> just kidding. I'm not trying to be discriminant. I just can only give away so many. <laughs> But anyway, um, Jerry, thanks for coming. Uh, let's welcome Jerry Cook as he comes and speaks to us. Great. Thank Jerry. you, man. Yep. Thank you, Matt. Wow. Good morning. How are you? Great way to spend a Sunday morning, isn't it? That's great. Yeah. Good. Boy, that's high. Yeah. The problem is that if you fall in a charismatic church, nobody will help you. <laughs> they, just, they just let you lay. You know, God, work him over good. It, <laughs> if I fall, help me, will you? I'm, a, I'm an awkward old man and it had nothing to do with the power of God. It just, just get me back up. I'm so glad to be here again. It was just about a year ago that we were here. And uh, I remember on the Saturday night, it was colder than Blitz, and we were down in the park, and, and uh, I, <laughs> I, someone gave me, I, I guess I was standing like, like, like this, trying to keep my hands warm, and, and somebody came running up and gave me a pair of red mittens to put on. I put them on. I still have them at home. I take them out periodically, look at them, and think of you guys, and hope, hope you're warm. <laughs> Thanks for getting the good weather out while I'm here. I appreciate that immensely. So nice to be with Matt and Heidi. I love them so much. They've been such an important part of Barbara and I's life for a long time. And um, they, they wear uh, their, their Christian faith so naturally. Uh, and and that, that's such, a, such an important gift and such an important pattern. 
you just see the natural life of Jesus being lived out. And uh, they do that with, with, with great giftedness. And, and they really love you. They talk about you a lot. And uh, they, they love you a lot. And I love them a lot. So I love you a lot. You see how that works? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Monday morning church, I was speaking on this back in Pennsylvania some time ago. And, and uh, they had a sign in the front of the, of the church property that just had what you just saw up there, the Monday morning church thing. And, and, and a lady called and said, well, what time is the meeting on Monday? And I thought, wow, you know, we are so locked in to church being a place we go at a time, a geographic location, that we go to church, we don't go to church. Hmm. When I was in seminary several hundred years ago, uh, a man used to come and speak at our, our uh, seminary pr at least once each term. Uh, or he should, excuse me. And his name was Richard Halverson. He was the pastor of the Fourth Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. at that time. And he later became the, ch the chaplain of the Senate. Was a remarkable, remarkable, godly Christian man. And he would come and, and speak to us. And it was always a highlight of the year when, when Dr. Halverson would come. And after a chapel on a particular time, uh, we were in the, the cafeteria just having cup of coffee or something, those of us that didn't have class right away. And there were three or four of us at a table just talking. Dr. Halverson came and sat down and just began to chat and, and, and talk with us. And one of the guys at the table said, Dr. Halverson, where's your church? And um, he looked authentically puzzled, uh, just, just kind of perplexed and didn't answer right away. And I thought, well, man, you know, you've been there 20 years. You, you probably should know where the thing is at. And, but I, you know, I was one of the few times I didn't say something stupid. <laughs> and uh, then he looked at his watch. And uh, I thought, well, he's missed the question. And then he said, well, it's about 2 o'clock in Washington, D.C. now. And the church I pastor is all over the city. Uh, it's driving buses working in restaurants, meeting in boards, uh, going over political issues on the hill. And he went down in a huge litany. I mean, it wasn't just three or four things. He went on and on and on and on and on and on. And you got the distinct understanding that he knew exactly where the church was. And then he said, Periodically, we get together at a building located at such and such a street, but we, we don't spend much time there. We're, we're mostly in the city. Now, that was in the, the middle, I, I hate to tell you, but, but the middle 1960s, before a lot of you were even born back, barely had television. <laughs> and, uh, and that was not a common idea. But when he said that, something, something exploded in me and pieces of theology began to fly together. Because what he was describing is the church not as a location, not as an activity, but as people in whom Jesus Christ's Spirit lives, who are dispersed through the city. And for the first time, I got a picture of the church as people. Now, I, I had, had argued with, uh, not, not, not blatantly or, or, you know, but just with the Lord about his wanting me to be a pastor. And do you ever, do you ever win those kind of arguments? You know, it's just like he puts his hands in his pocket and just smiles. He says, well, dummy, get it right, and you, you know. But, but, and it wasn't because I didn't love him. It's because I didn't understand. In my mind, church and pastoring a church was a lot like being a religious activities director. And I didn't want to be a religious activity. I didn't want to be an activities director of any kind. 
religious or otherwise. And I just didn't know how I would fit. And when Dr. Halverson said, the church is people, all of a sudden I understood something. I love people. If pastoring has to do with loving people, I'm in. I, I, that makes good sense to me. And as I begin to, to work that on through, that became seminal to, to my understanding of the nature of the church. And, and Monday morning church has to do with, with, with that idea that, that the church of Jesus Christ is not an activity, is not a meeting, is not a place. Now, we do have activities, we do meet, and we meet in a place. But none of those things are church. You can't go to church. You are the church. Do you follow? And, and that's, that's, that's exciting to me. All of a sudden, the whole thing makes good sense to me. Because I, 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 I think I'm smart enough to understand that we will never, ever get enough unbelieving people who need Jesus through that door to make any significant difference in this community or any other one. For a very, very simple reason. Unbelievers don't want to go to church. Whoa, wow, what a deal. <laughs> Did you before you became a believer? Oh, I just can't wait for Sunday to come so I can go to church. Are you kidding me? <laughs> not only did you not go, you couldn't understand people that did. Nobody's driving by the road out here and thinking, boy, I'm sure glad those Christians are meeting in there. <laughs> I don't go myself, but I'm sure glad they're meeting. They don't care. Hello? And if you're not here, they don't care about that either. Now, periodically, because of a friend, because of a relationship, because of a hunger, there will be people come through those doors seeking and searching for Jesus. That's marvelous because when we gather in his name, he is uniquely present. Do you follow? He's present in a remarkable way. And it's in that remarkable presence of Jesus that people who are searching and people that are hungry for not even what they know, they, 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 they see something, they sense something. There's an impulse that, that, that inclines them towards Jesus. And if you're here this morning, I'm describing you, I want you to know that whenever that inclination towards following Jesus, whenever that, that, that rises in you, and it will, that's not us setting you up emotionally. Okay? We're, we're not doing some kind of group hypnotism to get you in. Because really, frankly, I must say to you, this gathering this morning is not really about you. <laughs> it's about us being equipped to be Jesus in our world. But we're so thankful that you're here. Because if you didn't want to meet Jesus, this is a rotten place to be. <laughs> because he's here. And that inclination towards him, that's the Holy Spirit. That's him doing it. I'm not doing that. And we're not going to build this thing to a great ending. This is about as great as we're going to get. And this is about as good as it gets, too, for me. This is me anointed and charismatic. and This is it. I don't know what you expected, but this is it. But we're learning. And we set our times together for one single purpose. So that when we go out of here, we are the presence of Jesus in our community, in our world. That's what we're about, guys.
And that's the only thing we're about. I don't see the church as a, a, a many-faceted nor, nor many-commanded uh, thing. We're not here to do a ton of stuff. We're here to learn how to be and what it means to be Jesus in our world. I had a guy say, oh, pastor, I want you to pray for me. That, 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 that Jesus will just, just visit the guys at work. I said, wow. How are we going to know? Because I like to pray prayers that I know when they're answered. You know what I'm saying? And I said, well, how, how are we going to know if he shows up? I mean, is it going to kind of get, get glowy and, and, and sparkly gold chips start coming down? And he says, what are you talking about? I said, well, I'm just kind of wondering how you'll know if he comes. And he got really quiet and he looked at me. He said, he comes in me, doesn't he? I said, yeah. Jesus is present at your workplace every day. And he's placed a pastor there. And that pastor is you. And that congregation is yours. Do you understand? I was in line at a Safeway not long ago. Do they have Safeways here? I was in line at a Safeway and um, there was a little checker lady, a little young gal. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I just said, I, uh, as I was leaving, I just said, well, you know, I hope you're having a really good day. And she teared up. And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but this is a really difficult day for me. Wow. What are you going to do? There's people in line behind you. Well, I did what any good charismatic Christian would do. I hopped up on the counter, gave a message in tongues, touched her on the head, knocked her down. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> what I said, the first thing that came to my mind, why? Because I have the mind of Christ. Hello? So I can trust that. I just said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'll remember you. And every time I do, I'll pray for you. Is that okay? Oh, she said, thank you. And I remember her, and I pray for her every time I do. You see, that, that's what Jesus would have done there. Do you follow me? But we are so conversion focused that we miss the business that comes our way. We're not here to convert people. We're here to be Jesus in our world. Wow. And that is so exciting to me. So exciting. Well, I want to read a part of the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. I've got to be done at 10 after or Matt will not give me my honorarium. <laughs> so I'm going to be done at nine minutes after. Last night I went way too long. And I just, I just kept going. I couldn't figure out why. And, and, and when, I, when I turned off my microphone, it had a name on my microphone, and it was Heidi. <laughs> then I understood why I had such a hard time cutting it short. <laughs> but I've got the same one, but I've got it under control now, boy. I've, I've got, I know what I'm dealing with. So I'm leaving when I get hungry, and I'm a little bit hungry right now. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. NIV stands for New International Version, which is exactly the way Paul wrote it. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints that you really like, For all the saints, and Jesus loves some really crazy people. 
I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, isn't that a wonderful phrase? The glorious Father. Now, as we go on, we'll come to uh, some, some letters that are yellow, yellow letters. That means you read them with me. Okay? Now, don't mutter. Okay? When we come to those, give it some gusto. So that you may know Him better. You don't know Jesus better by studying books and listening to tapes, unless, of course, they're mine. You only know Jesus better because this is a capital S. That is, as the Spirit gives you wisdom and gives you a revelation of who He is. You don't know Him in your head. He is revealed to you by the Spirit in that place that you know stuff. Oh, where'd it go? The Bible left. Oh, there it is. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. What do you see in your heart? How, do, how, how are the eyes of your heart doing? Because it's out of the heart that the issues of life come. So it's important. And this says, turn the lights on in your heart in order that you may know three things. The hope to which he has called you. Now hope is not, I, I, I hope it happens, but I don't know if it will or not, but, but I, I, I'm hoping. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is a fact in the future. It's a solid reality to which you will come. It's there. You have hope. And it's not going to move around on you. You don't have to... It's there. It's solid. It's just in the future and you're coming to it. The hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saint, and three, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Wow. Hmm. Okay. That power, look at this, is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, this, this raised him from the dead is not just the, the issue of the resurrection. It's everything that Jesus raising from the dead implied. That the power of God now is, is, is reflective of that remarkable thing that Jesus did, which was take the penalty of sin for all of us. Now, what's the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And when Jesus died, we need to understand this. When Jesus died, you died. Okay? Just like in Adam, all sinned. Adam was a representative man. He acted for the human race. Jesus was the second representative man who acted for the human race. In him, we are all dead. In other words, the penalty for sin has been paid for every person. The wages of sin is death, period. And then Jesus Christ came and he said, let me change the grammar of your life. The wages of sin is death, comma. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life to them that believe. Believe what? Believe that the death of Jesus Christ was the end of the slavery of sin unto death. That's what redeemed means. Wages of sin, death. Jesus said, devil... I'm here. I'll pay the wages. And when I pay them, you have no more claim on these human beings. That's what redemption means. That's what it means you've been bought with a price. Do you follow me? And so people don't go to hell because of sin. They miss heaven because they won't receive 
forgiveness. Do you follow that? That they won't receive eternal life. It doesn't do you a bit of good unless you receive it. You can have a ton of money in the bank, but unless you'll draw it out and use it, it ain't going to do you any good. That power, that power is what's available to you. The power of a redeemed person who can stand in the very presence of God in the place where paradise, again, is a reality. It's a remarkable thing. And Jesus, he seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. I think I can do this. I want, I, I, I want to go sci-fi on you for a minute. It won't take long. Heavenly realms, heavenly places, in Christ, all of those terms. We think of heavenly places as one of the layers up there, so it's off there. And when the scripture says he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, that's neat, but I'd like a few of them down here if you don't mind. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It, 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 it's, it's a distance in, in many of our minds. And there's something that has helped me immensely in understanding there is no distance between me and the realms of heaven, between me and the spiritual place, between me and that place in Christ where all things are available to me. That's not a distant thing. And I have some friends that uh, are remarkable uh, actually mathematicians, but scientists, and, and they're doing a lot of experiments in dimensions. Now, we live in a three-dimensional world. Hello? Uh, Einstein posited four, completely confused me, so I just went back to three, and it's working pretty well for me. <laughs> but these experiments that these men are having have proven conclusively that there's not just three dimensions. There's not just four dimensions. There are unlimited dimensions. Worlds within worlds within worlds. Now see, I'm way over my head here. Okay? But I'm smart enough to know this. That if there is a God, and I thoroughly believe there is, He must transcend even an unlimited dimensional reality. So he lives transcended to unlimited dimensional reality. That means it would take unlimited dimensions for us to even begin to understand him. And he stepped down into and through three dimensions so that he became visible to us. And God in three dimensions is Jesus. We good here? Okay. Jesus is God up close. So it's terribly important that you understand when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That means Jesus is the best you can do with God in a three-dimensional world. But everything you see there in three dimensions is true in unlimited dimensions. So if you're loved in three dimensions, you're loved in unlimited dimensional reality. If there's no angry God, if Jesus is not mad at you in three dimensions, there's no angry God out there looking to get you. Amen. Now, see, that's important. So that we see in Jesus everything that God is, but we don't see all of God. One of these guys is working on dimensions, and he was listening to me talk about this. He was down in Texas, and uh, is a professor at the University of Texas, and he came up to me afterwards, told me what he was doing working with these dimensions, and he, he was about this close, you know, the American, proper American distance for conversation. And uh, 
He said, you know, with only six dimensions, if, if only you could, could function with six, th there are any number of things, actual, substantive things between you and me. But because they're not within a three-dimensional reality, we think there's nothing there. It's like sound. There are innumerable sounds, but you can only hear what comes within your range, and my range is getting pitifully small. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there isn't any sound there. It's just that it's not within your range. And that doesn't mean that there's no reality here. It's just not within my range. And all of a sudden, I begin to understand something. And as I study through Scripture, and I don't have time to go through all of this right now, but, but as I study through Scripture, I begin to realize that the in Christ position, that the heavenly place is in Christ, that's not up there someplace. That's a parallel reality. That's a parallel world beside me. That when Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, that doesn't mean he periodically comes down. That means that he is a parallel reality beside me at all times. And I access that parallel reality through the Holy Spirit that transcends that. He's the way I move into that, which I can't see, but which I know. That's why faith is a substance of things. What? Not seen. Well, that makes pretty good sense. What I can't see has substance. And I need to say to you, whenever you're in pain, and whenever you're in crisis, and whenever your world looks impossible, when you're in one of those nights that you can't get out of and you can't get through, when the pain on a scale of the 1 to 10, you've heard those? About 75. You don't need a God out there someplace looking. You don't need something way up there in heavenly places. You need to understand, He's not distant. There's a parallel reality. He's really with you. And you can simply ask Jesus, how did you do this? When you were in this kind of pain, when you were facing the extremes of the human condition, how, how, could you help me with this? And you begin to understand that you don't live singularly. It's not me going through this. It's us. And he says, those things that are impossible for you, they're possible with me. Do you understand? He's the one that brings the impossibilities into reality. And it's this parallel reality that's so tremendously important. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for... Now look at the color of this. You ready? For the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, the key, the operative thing here, the church which is what? His body. His body. What does your body do besides lose its shape? <laughs> your body expresses you. You're not a body, you have a body. And it's the means of expression. It works really well in a three-dimensional world. This body that you have was designed for a three-dimensional world. When you leave the three-dimensional world and go to that world of unlimited dimension, you have to get a new body. Hello? Doesn't that make pr pretty good sense? You've got to get one that will work there. But right now, you have a body. Jesus Christ is still incarnate in our world. The incarnation of Jesus did not end when he ascended. That's the whole point. Excuse me, I got some ice in there. Tastes pretty good, really. The incarnation of Jesus Christ 
continued beginning at the day of Pentecost, the located incarnation of Jesus, that in Palestine, in one person, that's what closed when Jesus went back to heaven. But when the Holy Spirit returned, he entered now these cleansed vessels that now are able to contain again the very Spirit of God. And he indwelt them. And now suddenly we are the incarnation, if you will, second stage. That doesn't mean we'll become sons of God like Jesus was. He was the only begotten of the Father. But he was also a prototype of a whole new creation. What is that? Those now who, in whom his spirit dwells, who can continue to function in the world like the incarnate Jesus Christ. Are you okay here? Hey, I'm out of here tomorrow. Don't worry about it. <laughs> what if that's true? What if when you leave here, and where you go to eat, that's the presence of Jesus. What if it's not a matter of doing what Jesus did? I, I love that bracelet, but... Frankly, by the time you figure out what Jesus would do, the opportunity to do anything is usually gone. You know, we're not here to do what Jesus would do. We're here to be Jesus, to respond as him, to, to be his presence in our world. And that's exciting to me. That's what church is all about. And we gather so that we can do that effectively. Now, let me give you a list of six or seven things so fast that you're not even going to believe that we can do it, but... Now, this is not a, a one, two, three, four, five. This is not a six-point sermon. This is just six points that flow from the Scripture that I've just read to you. First of all, if you want to become part of the church congregation on Monday, if you'd like to join the Monday morning church, have an accurate view of God. What kind of a God are you worshiping? You must understand that the only God there is is the one that Jesus revealed. Okay, that's the only God there is. Our American culture has a God that's responsible for both the good and the bad. And that cultural God has bled into a great deal of Christian thinking. So that when bad things happen, we ask God, you know, why did, you, why did you allow that? What's he trying to teach me? As though he needs disaster and pain and chaos and the results of sin, as though he needs the results of sin to teach us something. That's ridiculous, excuse me. The Scripture teaches he only does wondrous things. It's important. How do I know that? How do I know that my sickness didn't come from God? Because I don't read anywhere when he was here in three dimensions. I don't read anywhere where he took well people and made them sick. How do I know that God didn't take my loved one? Because when he was here in three dimensions, he never, he never murdered anybody. He never took living people and killed them. What did he do? He took dead people and made them alive. He took sick people and made them well. He didn't heal all the sick, but I'm telling you this. He didn't kill anybody, and he didn't make anybody sick. And if he didn't do it then, he's not doing it now. The reason sickness, disease, chaos, disasters happen on this planet is because of Uncle Adam and Aunt Eve and all of us. We are responsible for the mess. That's why he came. Chaos didn't come with him. Hope came with him. <laughs> I was in the hospital trying to recover from cancer surgery, and I was still a mess. And some guy, I don't, I don't even know who he was. I don't know how he even found me. But he came into the room, and, oh, Brother Cook. And right then I knew he was the enemy. Oh, Brother Cook, how could God 
bring cancer on such a... And I, and I just interrupted him. And I just said, go away. Well, Brother Cook, I'd go away. I don't have time to recover from you. God and I are doing fine. If my cancer bothers your theology, go handle it. I'm not here to perfect your theology. Because, you see, you go through a crisis with the God you started into the crisis with. And I knew. Just like I knew that when my doctor was coming to me, he was always on my side. He was never on the side of the cancer. He always came as my healer. He never came as my torturer or my executioner. Do you follow? If I need to know that about my doctor, you better believe I need to know that about my God. He is an ever-present help in time of need. And, and, and I, I could preach on that, but I won't. But do you get it? Do you get it? He is predictably good. And if your theology has a different kind of God, posit the fact of his predictable goodness and let him deal with your theology. Nail it. And, 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 and don't discuss it with me. It is not a discussable process for me. My God is good. I don't know what yours is like. But, but deal with it. Be a serious follower of Jesus. That means don't play the game. Get in. We are in this, and we're really in this. And we're serious about it. We haven't just added Jesus to our bag. Have the gifts of the Spirit in street form. Okay? The gifts of the Spirit were not given for the church to have in little groups and work on each other. The gift of healing is not so you can gather in your little group and lengthen one another's legs. Or whatever else, you know, you want to do there. You don't need a gift of the Spirit to be healed. It's part of your inheritance as a child of God. You don't need me to give you some word from God. You don't need a gift of prophecy. You don't need a gift of wisdom. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ. Will I work for you? You don't need me to tell you what God's going to tell, wants to say. He doesn't, he, he doesn't send mail for you to my address. He's smart enough to send it to your address. And you can hear the voice of God. And what I want you to do is not learn to hear the voice of God through me. I want you to hear the voice of God for you. So that when you're in Safeway, you can respond as Jesus. You don't have to run and get the pastor. Understand strategic placement. You're where you are by divine design. Understand that. This isn't fatalism. This is destiny. Have the heart of a spy. Oh, I, like, I love spy stories. I had a friend who was the West Coast Regional Director of the CIA. And he was a Christian. And I didn't even know you could do that. And he was telling me one day about how they'll work sometimes for years. I just take a little medication, dries my mouth out, so live with it. <laughs> and he said, we'll work for years to get a person, they call it deep in. <laughs> Way down in there, deep. And he says, when we get him in position, it could take years. When we get him in position, we give him his assignment. And when he does that assignment, boom, he's out of there. Wow. I like that. Jesus has got you deep in. Do you follow? By noon tomorrow, you're going to be with more people that don't know Jesus and want to than will come through the doors of this church in the next ten years. So don't tattoo a fish on your forehead. Don't blow your cover. Do you follow what I'm saying? 
Don't go to work and say, Hallelujah, here I am. <laughs> Just go in. You look like everybody else, but you're not like everybody else. You see what everybody else sees, but you see a whole lot more because of the Holy Spirit of God. You're a prophetic person. Prophets see and hear and speak from God's perspective. You see what's going on, but you see a little bit more. That's why you're there. He may have you on the job you're on, in the position that you're in, for someone who isn't even working there yet. But when they come, what about that? There's your assignment. Bingo. Now, I don't know about you. I just, that just turns me on. I like that a lot. And be open for business. Don't go looking for it. Don't go out there looking for business. Just be open. Open. When someone comes along and has a need, you, you don't have to preach them. The simple thing that you do when you meet people in need is what Jesus did. He simply asked them a question. Is there anything I can do for you? Blind Bartimaeus? Well, for heaven's sake, the guy is blind. And Jesus says, Bart, what, what would you like me to do for you? And he asked Jesus something that he had never, ever asked anybody before. I'd like new eyes. Wow. And Jesus said, We do eyes. <laughs> I gave him brand new eyes. Well, that, that's terrific. You can do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Is there anything I can do for you? And you have all the empowering of the Holy Spirit to respond to their request. Wow. Well, that's about what I wanted to tell you. God bless you. Thank you, Matt. Wow. Did you just blow your mind? <laughs> Did God just blow your mind? Do you see why I try to spend as much time with this man as I possibly can? I'd like to have him back more often than a year. Would you be okay with that? Okay, a little bit more often. All right. Well, as, as he was speaking, it, it, I'm sure brought a lot to, to mind, but I'm especially sensitive to the hope that is not just available, but that we can access as we reach out to the Lord, to His presence, that it's not like we have to wait till tomorrow. We don't have to wait till we get, go home. But we do need to respond to the presence of God. When He speaks to us, when He makes things available to us, when He makes things known to us, we need to respond. And I want us just to pray and respond to what the Lord's been saying to us today. So let's pray. Lord God, as we've been hearing Your Word and uh, just a, a great deal has been um, revealed to us even this morning. But I pray, Lord God, that more than anything else, that we'd be able to reach out to you, Jesus. A God who is described with one word. God is love. And Lord, you are the healer. Yes, you are powerful beyond our wildest imagination. You are present in a way that uh, we cannot even comprehend. But today I pray for each one of us as we look at our lives and the areas that we feel alone or the areas that we feel weak or the areas that we feel confused or broken down, the areas that we feel as if we need healing. Lord, we, we embrace you. We receive you today. Lord, I pray you would empower us and fill us. Lord, you've done that, but help us to be aware of that like never before. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in to Vantage Point, the teaching ministry of Faith Center in Eureka, California. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus, please email us or call us. We will respond to you and we have free resources that will help you get started in your walk with Christ. You can email us at prayer at eurekafaithcenter.org or you can call us at 707-442-1784. If you would like prayer, please email us or give us a call. Visit our website at eurekafaithcenter.org. 
There you can give online, you can download podcasts, and you can get more information on the ministries of Faith Center. Come visit us. We have services on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. Saturday nights at 6 p.m., Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. We also have Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights at 7 p.m. I hope you'll tune in again next week for Vantage Point.